So what I wanted to do today is um, not uh, is kind of discuss a, a process where we look at some topics, we try to turn them into issues, and maybe come up with some resolutions. Now the story message part is where we're headed, but we won't do that today. But that's what we'll kind of prepare for the next time. Mm -hmm. And when we look at the, the grand scheme of things, that's because you know we're trying to develop a pitch here, which is what we'll do in another session. But when we have our story message, it helps us develop things like the dramatic question, other things that we can do for a pitch. So I'm gonna put that aside for now. And um, I've got some blank sheets for issues that we can create, and I'm gonna put them over here as a reminder that that's something we're gonna work on. And then resolutions as a reminder is that's something we're gonna work on. And I got some topics to discuss. Um, let's see, let me prepare something over here so I know that I've got all that ready. Given that we're, I don't know when, you know, when we watch this or when other people see this, but we are in the coronavirus pandemic and it's uh, mar middle of March, kind of later March. And one topic that I thought might be kind of interesting to talk about is the sharing economy because we heard an awful lot about that over the last decade and how great you know, the sharing economy would be. And, and, you know, there's some nice ideas in there, but I was always skeptical, to be honest, because I thought the sharing economy was sort of a, a cover for the gig economy, mm -hmm. which was a freelance economy in which everybody became more precarious and lost their job security, but were told that it's okay, it's even better because we have freedom of choice and we can make our own hours and all the rest of it. Um, and... In this pandemic, I actually see the hoarding economy taking place instead of the sharing economy. Maybe that comes later. Maybe human nature over time will kick in and think about community. But right now, certainly in the West, there is an every man for themselves kind of attitude in the U.S., maybe in the U.K. where you are, I don't know. Mm -hmm. yep. But, you know, we've seen all the toilet papers disappeared Food is disappearing. Everyone's basically stockpiling everything they can get their hands on. And so I'm kind of wondering, you know, what has happened to the sharing economy? Uh, a friend of mine, you know, told me that hospitals in the U.S. are going to their biggest donors and asking them to get their hands on equipment by any means necessary from overseas or whatever connections they have. So in this uh, sharing economy, we have, for example, <laughs> this is a list of hospitals around the U.S. That, and, and what they're looking for at the moment. So here's California. You know, basically, it's mm -hmm. hard to read, I know, but it says, you know, mm -hmm. surgical masks, medical gloves. You know, these are, again and again, all these hospitals are saying we don't have any of the equipment we need. And this is state by state by state, and it goes on. So... The sharing economy now is, yeah, share, share medical equipment with hospitals because we don't have enough. Um, but as for a community level sharing economy, it's not, it's not something I've seen yet. Although in Asia, I'm told that, you know, that that is very much the case. In Japan, for example, hoarders are shamed because that's working against the community interest. So I... I wanted to, to uh, uh, talk about that. And then I thought, you know, for our amusement, it might be interesting to watch something about the sharing economy. Now, hopefully the audio works. <laughs> we haven't tested this before, but let's see. Let's, let's, let's enjoy this, uh, this presentation. Okay. Opportunity okay. is everywhere, like here and here. See, opportunity, everywhere, about to be parents, meeting the parents, and this driver, logging out to watch his kid hit one out of the Opportunity is everywhere. All you have to do to find it is get out, here. Opportunity right, so. is everywhere. So that, I hope you could hear. Mm -hmm. That is uh, Uber with uh, opportunities are everywhere. 
Um, just get outside, right? Just get out the door. And mm -hmm. I know I'm being a bit naughty and cynical, but I always felt that Uber was a bit cynical uh, in its messaging, you know, the way it treated its employees and stuff. Actually, they're not employees, excuse me. Uh, treated the employees would have the, rights. Yes. It <laughs> treated whatever they called their drivers. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I don't know if you have any thoughts on the sharing economy, but I was kind of in a dark mood wondering, you know, what happened and where is all this opportunity that, uh, that is everywhere. Um, we have to make it obviously, but, uh, <laughs> that's something to think about. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I mean, I'm, I'm in the same boat as you. I think it, I don't think it's improved our lives. It's made taxis cheaper. That's about well, it. It's, 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 con it's convenience. Yeah. Um, I mean, okay. So a couple of things are, it still has to be based on an exchange of something. So right. if what you've got to exchange has no value, then it's there, there is no sharing. And what defines the value of the thing that you're sharing is a new marketplace, which is basically saying uh, that people who don't have anything better to do can fill up their time doing stuff for other people who apparently do have better things to do. Mm -hmm. um, and that's it. You're, you're becoming a, an accessory to a richer person. You, you said the word value which I think mm -hmm. is uh, important to think about because we have a system in the West in particular which values um, things financially. So mm -hmm. if you can put a price on it, that becomes the proxy for value. Um, but we have identified that this you know, leads to a lot of uh, strange incentives and behaviors because there are more things in life that have value than just the price that can be put on them. So I think that in the sharing economy, that was one of the, the problems, one of the, where the faulty logic was, is that, you know, price is not the only, uh, the best perhaps, um, way of capturing value, of looking at value, mm -hmm. that there are other things that are important to people. And indeed, you know, one of the marketing messages to, you know, gig economy freelance workers was, Look at all the freedom of choice you have and to make your own schedule. And yeah, that is valuable to many of those people. Not all. Some people felt that it was more like servitude. But I think to some people that have more flexibility and options in their life, then yes, it is valuable to, to be able to make their own schedule and whatnot. But, you know, this was kind of touted as the reason to accept all the other awful stuff that went with it. Um, and because these 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 other factors weren't put into the value measure metric, so it's something that is worth um, uh, thinking about. Uh, the other topic that I thought I'd throw out there is um, you know we've heard a lot about herd immunity um, in the news, and uh, let's see here is a, a definition of it just so that we're all on the same. Hmm page because a lot of things have been said about it politically and this and that but i think the the way that i look at it is that very simply with exceptions simply put the idea is that if 75 percent of a community has immunity then they shield the 25 percent that don't in a nutshell mm -hmm. obviously with different viruses and whatnot they have different percentages that are required for herd immunity. But I think 75-25 is just a basic rule of thumb. And if I'm not mistaken, this got picked up a lot in the UK, right, where you are, because people thought they heard the government say, hey, this is a pandemic strategy. We just isolate the elderly, let everyone else get infected, and then we basically have protected the elderly in future by having herd immunity. Is that roughly what you heard i mean it's there? it's what it's it's the government has tried to claim it's not doing that but i don't know where the words came from but it was certainly brought up quite early on uh to explain our inactivity 
because we did not. Oh, right, right. <laughs> Give uh, me an excuse, I see. Move. We did not move uh, as fast as other nations did. Well, no, there's a there's a story running at the moment in the Sunday Times that the government has refuted that Dominic Cummings, who is this, um, he's without portfolio and he's an advisor to the prime minister. He was a, he's, he's thought of as a person who likes to, he's an iconoclast who likes to rip things apart and he hates the civil service. And apparently at a brief, at one of the first briefings they had about the coronavirus, um, he is claimed in this Sunday Times article to have said, look, the people who are going to die are old people and they would have died anyway. That's been refuted by the government, but he has such a sway over the prime minister that it is believed that actually that may have been the case. And that was part of the reason why this herd immunity thing started to go out, which is this whole nudging idea of we don't want to tell you to stop doing something. We're just going to make it difficult for you to do that thing so that you eventually get the message that you shouldn't do that thing without us ever having to have done it. Nudging. Yeah. Hmm. Um, well, so I heard it, that, that this, I mean, I think that this probably was a consideration amongst epidemiologists that might be advising mm -hmm. government. There's a website I came across that had a lot of quotes in the UK yeah. from different uh, leading sources, you know, from Imperial College and Cambridge and all these places. And this was said a great deal. And I think mm -hmm. that if I was going to put it in the best positive light, I suspect that they thought if we isolate the elderly, then we can use a herd immunity strategy because younger people seem to not have such serious consequences from the illness. But that what ended up happening was that this wasn't true in the UK, the US and other Western countries. In other words, in Asia, it seemed from the data that was coming in that yes, the people who were over 60 were had a much higher incidence of having serious complications from this and that younger people were more, more uh, had, had better outcomes. But that mm -hmm. when it got to the West, that was not the case. That under 60s were being affected in pretty large numbers. And I just heard this morning that in New York, um, half of the people in the critical ICU are under 60. So yeah. um, that herd immunity strategy that perhaps in the best case, best light was is just not going to work because this is, this virus is affecting almost everybody. Maybe not young, young children, but but uh, it's going through the population and affecting. Well, but it's also that the, it is such a new disease that we're, it's unclear whether we can develop an immunity to it. True. So the whole thing is moot anyway, if wave two and wave three are exactly the same thing, you know, exactly the same blight again. Um, Indeed, we don't develop immunities to influenzas. I do wonder though, and I'm not a medical specialist, so I, I don't know, but I think that having interactions with influenza gives us some benefit because it seems that when people, for example, immigrate, emigrate to the US who come from places like in South America that just don't have any influenzas at all, they are extremely vulnerable when the flu comes through, even young children. Mm. So maybe some kind of influenza exposure is, uh, has made certain communities a little hardier in that regard, but you're right. It'll just keep coming back every year. And uh, I mean, that was in um, uh, germs, guns, and steel. One of his primary things about the, the devastation of South America when the conquistadors went through and most of that was disease. It was that because we were living in such tight clumps in Europe that we'd gone through all the diseases for the most part. And therefore we'd sort of weaponized ourselves without knowing it. Well, we saw this here recently when the Trump administration decided to put um, immigrants in cages close together and not to give them medical care. And we had some one or a, a couple, uh, maybe two or three children, young children from Guatemala and places like that die of, the, of colds. So um, that was brought home, you know, quite recently. 
uh, in, in that in, in in the news here. So, I guess you know just to be kind of you know uh, mischievous, I was thinking about you know herd immunity, and I don't know maybe maybe I'll write this write this down too, although it's kind of silly. But I was thinking about herd immunity versus uh, let me put the camera on the tabletop, but herd immunity versus uh, herd mentality uh, because I was thinking about social media and wondering, you know, can, can there be such a thing as herd immunity in social media? Because, you know, social media has viruses uh, take hold as well in the form of fake news and disinformation and whatnot. And so it struck me that maybe, you know, the 75% could protect the 25% so long as the 75% had critical thinking or critical reasoning going on. Hmm. Because then when they kind of got hit by, you know, fake news and disinformation, they could kind of bounce it off again to protect the 25% that seem to believe anything that they read. And, and uh, you know, maybe it's larger than 25%. Maybe that's a tipping point is that when more than 25% don't have good bullshit detection, the sort of virus takes hold and it just is a pandemic, which um, seems to be the case on, on uh, Twitter and Facebook and stuff. So we need uh, critical thinking and reasoning to protect us all. That's, that's the immunization maybe that we need against the bullshit of the, of the, uh, uh, of the other side. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway. Well, but, the, but we're talking about when you were talking about value, let's go back to sharing economy again. You know, what if someone wanted to be infected? So therefore, a person being infected, it can now advertise that as a thing. That's now a thing they've got. You want to get this disease, you want to get it early, get it over with, I've got it. Also, my symptoms are very mild, so perhaps yours will be too. Contact me now, I will stand next to you and infect you. Virus parties. In fact, you, last time I spoke to you, you told me about um, an infection game. Uh, oh yes, yes. Well, Dan told what, me about what, it. Yeah. yeah. What was it again? I, well, no. It's just it's on. It's on. It, it was a hashtag on Twitter, and it was people sharing uh, videos of themselves um, licking subway holes in New York. Um. The idea being, look how dangerous I'm being. Uh, and people were clicking and giving them likes and subscribes or whatever it is you do on Twitter, I guess, subscribing. I've seen some videos of some temples where people are, they lick um, the gates and things because they're holy. So mm -hmm. that has uh, um, encouraged the spread. So I... I encourage people to be safe, you know, in this in this time and to find, you know, any kind of makeshift uh, method of taking precaution that they have. Um, and uh, I've got, got a large version of you behind. I don't know quite Excellent. what happened there. But anyway, um, yeah. we're oh, going to have to take extreme again. measures, you know. It's that uh, photographer again. <laughs> well, let's see. I've got. Yeah, I've got. Yeah, there uh, you go. Uh, yeah, yeah. Get that <laughs> every every <laughs> podcast at least. This once. is yeah. Th sorry, this is this is the this is love in the future of uh, in in our future. Uh, what we have to look forward to, or you know, quarantining the the elderly as well. So <laughs> that's, uh, right, that's terrible. And maybe uh, we'll have you know coronavirus fashion too. So it's something nice. uh, something to look forward I bet to. You, we will. I bet designer gas mask will be all the rage next year. Guaranteed, one hundred percent. Well, there was one called O Air or something, which has this sort of open area here, and mm. it has some kind of filtration system that tries to blow clean air into your nose and mouth, that it's circulating, okay. and has, I guess, UV light try to kill bacteria ah. or something. I mean, it's a okay. it's a very high end contraption. I don't know if it works, but you know. So, so when I was reading some of the news, I also started to think about how, you know, cruise ships have been sort of a, a great global analogy uh, for uh, coronavirus. And um, there was even like uh, this, this, this interesting article in the New York Times about how 
you know, these cruise ships just kept operating despite, you know, knowing what was happening in other cruise ships around the globe. Mm. And so what I thought was interesting in telling about that is like a little microcosm of what's happening globally. For example, um, in the beginning, they just had an improvised response to the virus. They had no planning, no pre-planning, despite the fact that they have outbreaks on ships going back to time immemorial. So when they were interviewed, they just said, you know, every situation was unique as if that was an excuse not to have any strategy or planning. So there was no authority. There was also at the ocean, there's a lack of you know, jurisdiction. So they're all kind of making it up as they go along. They had right. no no testing whatsoever. So they just responded to any kind of obvious symptoms. So as we know so, from other places, that means that it goes rampant. Um, customers held on to the hope that um, the executives knew what they were doing and that they would be saved somehow. But this is like mm -hmm. us with our Western governments. You know, we look at China, Singapore, Korea, and Taiwan and see this amazing kind of response. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, we look at our government and feel like it's really let us down and uh, it doesn't seem to know what it's doing. So we're like the customers on the cruise ship. Then the cruise ship started doing some forms of social distancing, such as taking the serving utensils away from the buffet. <laughs> and oh, they God. said that, that no more pool parties, but casinos were okay, you know. So basically, you know, kind of doing what we're doing sometimes where we try to protect economies, but, you know, <laughs> do this like nibble on the edges, but, you know, don't do anything radical. Now yeah. we're doing something radical, but that's because we really let the shit hit the fan. Um, yeah. They did some quarantining, right? They had some some uh, guests stay in their cabins. And then you have, you know, all the healthcare workers, who in this case are the cruise ship workers, who are overworked, have low mm -hmm. pay, just like our nurses, you know, mm -hmm. and, and they're not given any equipment. They have to improvise protective gear. <laughs> like they have to put napkins on their faces um, and do all this kind of stuff. Um, and... Throughout all this, as the article makes it clear in the, in the headline, um, the economy comes first, right? Because the, the ship must sail. So mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if this is happening in other ships of their fleet around the world. The ship must sail. The show must go on because, you know, the money is important. And then, as we've heard later, these ships, you know, some of them were allowed to dock, not so much anymore. And when they let off passengers, those passengers became super spreader, spreaders mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, you know, really affected our economies. And I thought it was kind of funny that Trump, I don't normally find him funny. I mean, he, I have to say he gets under my nerves a lot, but he thought that he suggested that the, <laughs> that the, the cruise ships become floating hospitals. And I thought that was um, mm -hmm. deliciously amusing and dark, you know, that, that we just basically put all the people we don't, we, we don't, we can't help and stick them on a big cruise ship and put them out to sea and just say, you know, right. uh, you know you're on your own. You got some medical staff there. Hopefully you work it out and don't come back and, and infect the rest of us. Um, so um, <laughs> with that in mind, I I had to share with you. you now, we, we had talked in the past about, um, I think, residency, which mm -hmm. has been rebranded as the world and i oh. this is these are luxury residences right um for people i think they range from like a million to seven million bucks you get your apartment on the world okay. and uh it's a you know you travel to, you travel around and and i don't know if we could watch a bit of this video but it's um it's uh, quite amusing given the circumstances. The world is the largest private residential yacht on earth. An international community of global adventurers, each sharing a sense of wanderlust and a thirst for knowledge. Each day, you travel the globe with an unmatched depth of exploration and return to the comfort of your very own home. Intimate, curated excursions await just outside your door. Incredible expeditions from remote destinations to celebrated cultural capitals create the remarkable memories few are fortunate to experience. Every destination 
is brought to life with renowned experts for a profound immersion you won't find anywhere else. And as a homeowner, you have a voice in choosing the ship's itinerary and have access to the planet's most exclusive locations. At the end of each day, return to the comforts of your own private residence filled with like your belongings, all your, your stuff. books, your artwork, you your stuff even your you wine collection. You Host friends for an intimate in-residence meal, freshly prepared by one of the world's masterful chefs right in your kitchen. Or enjoy wonderful gastronomic creations in one of the ship's six diverse dining venues. Aboard the world, your every need is tended to. Your onboard team anticipates the specific preferences of each resident every detail from innovative haute cuisine to housekeeping services to tailored wellness programs each customized specifically for you active lifestyles are equally valued on board and off from enriching learning opportunities with noble laureates to simply perfecting your swing as an owner aboard the world you will be one of the privileged few who enjoy the highest standards of luxury living, an unprecedented breadth of global exploration, and the unique camaraderie of an international community of adventure seekers. It is a home that offers a lifestyle unlike any other. This is The World. We had to we had to do a little kind of jump cut there because we uh, had some problems, some technical issues. We didn't want to bore everybody with. So, I was just thinking about that that world video that we watched. That uh, you know, it said you'll be one of the privileged few, and I thought there's very few people on that ship, right? It's like the world has kind of come to an end, and they're happily traipsing mm -hmm. around visiting all the, the Galapagos Islands and whatever when the rest of the world is dead or something. It's like. Uh, uh, and then I thought it was funny that you can travel the world with all your stuff. And then I was thinking about how their tagline was, you know, you can go to the remote corners of the world. I was thinking you can go to the remote corners of the world and infect them. <laughs> <laughs> so the so this ship, um, I read that the average owner is in their mid-60s. Yeah, there so you I go. Let that sink in. And then it serves as kind of a three to four month vacation retreat. So mm -hmm. I see a good disaster movie possibility here <laughs> with, with the world residences uh all sorts of possibilities to think about um so that brings me to my next uh one which is social distancing because that's something that's been on the, in the news sorry my handwriting looks like a little bad it's like social distracting or something social distancing yeah. um and you know with that in mind i was i came across this website you know here about how social isolation is really a huge problem for the elderly and that it posed lots of health risks, right? And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it says that, uh, you know, we really, it, it leads to all these physical problems, right? So it is unfortunate that in this epidemic, that is what we are saying we must do with our older population because this is just going to increase their livelihood. I mean, there's somewhere in here it even says, you know, they get more viruses and things, you know, as a result of oh, Lord. isolation. So, okay. so it's, it's, uh, it's, it, we are kind of compounding the problem a little bit, but what do we do? I mean, some friends of mine were telling me that they have literally taken their, their elderly parents who are in their eighties out of their home, put them somewhere else and made sort of ring fenced them so that nobody can have hmm. contact with them except for one or two people that, that are themselves or neighbors that they've chosen. And they have like a bucket of disinfectant that things have to be dipped into if they're, you know, if it doesn't damage them before they hand them over. Right. And people have to disinfect anything that they've got from the shops to give to them. So it's, uh, you know, this, this is going to perhaps worsen the problem in a way unintentionally the unintention unintended consequences of of that um so we're you know we're kind of doing this for their own good but it's going to lead to depression and illness 
Um, and it kind of makes me think again of herd immunity because, you know, that we talked about how that works if, you know, you can kind of isolate the vulnerable properly. But in Los Angeles, I heard that um, in, uh, in a decade from now, over 25 percent of the population will be over 65. So that's hmm. that's that magic 25. Right. So, you know, if you try to shield the elderly or whatnot, it isn't going to work. Um, so we've been doing quarantining and also it made me think of the hiki komori which we we talked upon mm -hmm. in the past um and these are people in japan who just drop out of society they tend to be young men sort of in their late 20s early 30s who who suffer a kind of setback in work or in school and they just decide to drop out and they just live at home stay in their room all day you know play video games do whatever they want to do and they don't just don't go out and interact with much of society and i think the latest the latest poll was that this is about seven hundred thousand people so sure. i sort of wondering you know this is a form of chronic isolation kind of wondering if that's something that we're going to see on the horizon ourselves from all the stuff that's going on and I know we're kind of bombarding, but I'm going to add um, this one here with this euthanasia. It's a horrible concept, but I'm just thinking about this in terms of what we're talking about, that we're maybe leading to senicide, which is sort of like the killing of the elderly. Um, in other cultures around, you know, in the past, there's been talk about things like this. In, in uh, Japan, there's the Oba Sute, and there was this mm -hmm. famous movie called The Ballad of Narayama, where it's Obasteyama, where they take... This man, this man takes his elderly mother to a mountain to abandon her, and the mother is encouraging him to do this. You must do this to sort of protect the community. I'm a drain on resources. Now, this is a bit mythical. It's not clear whether this really mm -hmm. was done to any great deal in Japan, but these sort of myths pop up in other cultures. So I guess, you know, we think about it because it's a bit of a taboo, but in a, at the same time, you know, in times of crisis, there's these talks about, you know, people who are drained on resources and, and whatnot. And it makes me think of, um, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, who and you can't see the quote, but he just says, you know, that older people are basically useless because younger people are just smarter. And so, you know, in his mind, you know, we should do a, uh, uh, a, suicide on a, on a massive scale. And of course, that reminds me Logan's Run. Yes, that film we talked about recently of, you know, this idea that at the age of 30, you have to kill yourself, although they don't believe they're killing themselves. They believe they're ascending to some great kind of communal. Um, and it's really kind of a cynical way of managing their population and managing the scarce resources that they have. So, you know, it, we, we have a kind of belief in scarcity in the scarcity model in the West because, you know, it's every person for themselves and they're hoarding stuff and all this and that. And so some of these ideas, um, as dark as they are, kind of keep coming back to haunt me um, in times like this because this is suggesting that genocide is good for the economy, good for, for society. Um, and then I've got one more to add to the mix. I don't know if we can, yeah. if we can, no, it's a, I'm bombarding, I know. Getting, getting them all in, we got, I got viral marketing um, because, you know, part of me was wondering if we'd ever see this term used again because it was so popular up till now. But there is a kind of a literal way of thinking about viral marketing. And I refer us to, to uh, gene therapy. Um, and this website talks about, you know, how does gene therapy work? And basically... You know, you, you, you're, you're replacing DNA in a person or a population and you need a way, you need a vector. And so viruses are the vector by which you can have uh, the DNA in your body swapped out. So, of course, it made me think of a more kind of sinister idea that, you know, viral marketing literally becomes a way of pushing out a new upgrade or something to the population. Uh, basically, you're marketing a new skill or a new, um, it could be something mm -hmm. negative as well. 
and you're doing it by through through virus, you know, um, dissemination of the population. And of course, you know, when when coronavirus first appeared, there were some conspiracy theories about how, um, you know, in in the in China where it broke out, there is supposedly a, a research center, a SARS research center, that's been you know manufacturing viruses of various kinds to sort of understand how SARS and works. And of course, this coronavirus is a is a variant of SARS. So, you know, the idea is, did this thing get out of the lab by mistake? Then, of course, there was another conspiracy theory that Chinese were, were sending around that the U.S. had placed this virus there and all kinds mm. of stuff. But, but I think if we put that aside for a moment, you know, there is, you know, if you want to change a population um, for the better or for the worse, clearly, you know, coronavirus, a, a, a SARS, is a very effective means of doing so. And so, you know, maybe we should look at this as a kind of a new form of propaganda in the future where you're actually changing people physically. Um, and to remind ourselves about, you know, the meaning of viral marketing, it's sort of that that people, you know, spread something uh, themselves. Although, you know, to some degree, I feel like, you know, Traditional media and social media aren't really that different. You know, in traditional media, it's sort of top-down approach. In social media, it's also top-down because the propaganda is then spread by by people mm. amongst themselves. So, um, uh, sorry, that's herd immunity, euthanasia. So, mm. uh, viral marketing and euthanasia, the sharing economy. That's my that's my buffet of topics, and I want to see if we can maybe come up with some issues based on those. Now issues, just to remind ourselves, we're going to try to frame, frame a question, an open-ended question, something that maybe provokes some thought but doesn't come down on a, a hard line on, on an answer. Whereas a resolution is that hard line that provokes a kind of debate. So, um, Maybe to get us started, um, I just sort of have this issue. You know, what if a virus was good for you? What if a virus was good for you? Um, mm -hmm. The, you know, um, uh, invasion of the body snatchers, you know, does not, suggest the viruses are good for you, but of course the, the invaders think the virus is good for you and they would like you to change into one of them. Um, so it depends on perspective, but, but if you were, you know, if you were a government that's pushing out an update to the population, then they would mm -hmm. say this, this virus is good for you and you should welcome it. Um, so I'm trying to think of other situations in which, uh, you know, they, uh, you were talking about infection, infection games. Um, I knew somebody that when, when my kids, when I think my uh, my kids had gotten, uh, they had not been inoculated, I guess, in time for, for uh, chicken pox. <clears throat> and then he said, "Oh, can I come over with my kids so I can, you know, expose them? Ideally, we should be vaccinating instead of doing things like that." But um, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, virus you know, is good for you to get the immunity right Jeez. there is also cases where people seem to be immune to certain forms of meningitis because they had an influenza of some kind when they were young this is a theory i mean there's mm. there does seem to be cases where you get something in the past and that that uh primes you to to handle something else in the future although i've heard the opposite for coronavirus in the case of some of the people that have these cytokine storms and these immune responses that are overblown and then result in pneumonia and stuff that there's a theory that maybe it's because they were primed in their youth by some other disease that is making their bodies overreact to this one so but what if viruses are good for you propaganda is good for you that's a virus that's good for you right if you are a government uh, that needs to change the hearts and minds, mm -hmm. uh, you would say that's good for you and you need to spread that, that kind of viral marketing. Is there any other way we can connect these dots?
Well, I mean, it, again, if you're using a virus to wipe out the elderly, then that's removing parasites from society. So targeted virus to remove weaker elements of society will keep society strong and vibrant, or indeed just allow it to survive. Well, I think what you said about the weak, we can form some political idea or, or social idea about mm -hmm. who the weak are, mm -hmm. and then suggest that yes, this virus is just encouraging the survival of the fittest. It's a removing the weak and therefore we should welcome this. Um, yes, that's a very nice, dark idea. Um, I mean, it's kind of, I mean, when you think about it, I'm going to be provocative, of course, it's a bit like capitalism, right? Because capitalism says, hey, if you, you know, the weak perish, you know, you mm -hmm. can't pull your weight. You know, the weak uh, deserve, um, you know, to die because they're not, they're not adding value. And mm. capitalist system sort of like looks upon everybody as capital. So, you know, some people are worth more than others. And therefore, you know, uh, it's a, you know, it's a, maybe capitalism is a virus of some kind. Um, <laughs> that certainly people that, you know, wholeheartedly and believe in it above all things, you know, it's like they're, they've been infected by the, the invasion of the body snatchers. Um, well, it's true, but to go to back to the self-isolation thing, you know, are we better off alone? Are we better off? Is, is this showing us okay. we are better off alone? We shouldn't be depending on other people. We shouldn't be forming bonds with other people. We shouldn't be mixing with other people. I'm going to write that down. Are we better off alone? Now. You can't see this because we... Or do the risks of social interaction now outweigh the benefits? Mm -hmm. Well, I think I'm, I'm going to keep that under are we better off alone because, mm -hmm. yeah, that, that encapsulates that. But you're right. It's on the reframing of it. Is it, is it too dangerous to socialize? Um, we, we sort of, when we have these things happen, I remember when you and I were young during the AIDS crisis um, and for a time when people didn't really know how it was, mm. how it was transmitted and where, you know, what it was exactly. There was all sorts of fear that you couldn't, you know, you couldn't get close to people. You couldn't touch what they touched. You couldn't eat what they touched, you know, that sort of thing. We had mm -hmm. a similar period of, of paranoia where it wasn't worth the risk uh, being close to someone who, you know, you thought could be, um, a victim. Mm. Uh, so yes, it'd be interesting if that, you know, if we, this, this mentality carried forward for a long time, I have, um, another one, which, <laughs> cause my camera's not working. <laughs> you get, let's see if I can get to there. Does herd immunity save the right people right <laughs> so right so that one is a bit That's dark as well it's like you know we have this herd immunity idea being floated but but does herd immunity save the right people because mm. maybe those people shouldn't be saved right that's part of your uh well part of the initial what if virus is good for you what if it isn't who should it be good for <laughs> yeah no it's good um, the the viral marketing i guess we i guess we kind of the sharing economy okay so we haven't really well so the, the, the so the, the the truly desperately awful thing about herd immunity is the idea is at least in the in the way in which it's being espoused because herd immunity is really as it even says there especially through vaccination is the whole point but we don't have a vaccination mm -hmm. um it's not quite enough if you just expose the largest number of people possible to this illness. Um, and it was clearly at one point thought of as a possible response to this virus because uh, Imperial College, I believe it was, uh, did three, basically they did, right, what happens if we do nothing? And what are the, what's the, what is the, the, the casualties we're expecting from that? What if we do something mild 
and what if we do full full on lockdown of the population? And they looked at those three things, and it was basically going from uh, I think it was two hundred thousand would die if they did nothing, versus twenty thousand die if we do this severe lockdown. And it was it was this report that finally made the scientists who are advising the prime minister go, oh, these figures coming out of Italy are much much worse. Therefore, we can't we can't do that. We can't do two hundred thousand deaths. Mm -hmm. um, Whereas 20,000, the flu is 8,000 a year. So it's only twice as bad as the flu. And a bit. Yeah, um, so there's, a, there's a cost benefit there. But the real problem, and, and this is the problem that we're all going to have quite soon, is the number one people being targeted by this are the medical professionals. And they're the ones who are going to fall ill. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones who are going to be casualties, particularly if we don't have the protective equipment for them, which I know Britain certainly doesn't, and I'm guessing America may run out too. No, it doesn't. I mean, I think that in a way you're describing, you know, excuses or reasons for not doing very much. Um, I think we saw I think it's run out of in other countries that, that, you know, that respond overreacting in the beginning is the right response. Yes. And and anything less anything short of that creates problems. And right now, you know, the way we're framing it in the West is to say, gosh, you know, it's the sort of tension between public safety and the economy. Because if you go towards if you veer towards public safety first, you crater the mm. economy. If you career towards mm. keeping the economy going, you you crater public safety. And I think that that's that that way of thinking, putting those two things in antithesis, is because of the system that we have. I mean, it doesn't need to be that way. You could actually have a system where both things are are taken in equal measure, but we've crafted a system where it really is either or, um, and uh, hmm. that's that's a wake up call perhaps for us. I don't think people hmm. are going to really think about that very deeply, but you know we should be because. Um, uh, it doesn't have to be either or, I don't think. Yes. Um, and that's, I think, what the kind of socialist movement is trying to suggest is that, you know, you can have these things managed. You could, you could have capitalism with certain controls. You can have public safety, public security, mm -hmm. public safety nets and things with certain controls. You can do all these things. There is a way to... to to, to, to take the edge off the extremes and not have it be such a wild swing from one side to the other. But mm -hmm. um, hmm. well, I those th those three issues are a good start, and I wish I could um, show it. <laughs> but, uh, let me let me see if I can get the camera going. We can try this again, and maybe for a short period of time get this to work. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure what has happened. I'm wondering if there's a setting that I've kind of... Could it be going to sleep or something? Uh, it, it could be. I And, and so maybe... There you go. Maybe, hey! Maybe I knocked the setting because, it you know, it should not be turning off. It has power, but but whatever. So I'm going to pick up where we left off. So jump jump cut because of problems with, with technical problems. But we got our camera back on the tabletop. Um, so these are sort of the issues that we've come up with at the moment. We have, what if a virus was good for you? Are we better mm. off alone? And does mm. herd immunity save the right people? So then we're going to try to take those and come up with some, you know, uh, resolutions. And to start us off, I, I have one that I crafted. Well, hang on, let's try to know, what if, what if the, what if, because you were talking about, I don't, I don't, I don't quite understand how people who are social distancing can get more viruses than people who aren't which is something you were saying the article put out. But what if the cure to a virus is worse than the virus itself? Okay. What if a cure to the virus is worse than the virus itself? And that could also tie in with what you were just saying about the economics of it. Right. If it's shutting down our entire state for X number of months and that brings our capitalist state to 
doom, that is a judgment that politicians are making. Well, that dovetails nicely into one of the resolutions I prepared before, which yeah. is that coronavirus is just what we need right now to save ourselves. So this is a provocative resolution as it's meant to be, because you could yes. argue both sides. You could say, yes, coronavirus is just what we need right now because we have a corrupt system that puts, you know, the, the capitalist system and all these sort of things that creates these binary decisions that are terrible. Um, so therefore, this just wipes the slate. We can usher in a new new era. Think about the depression and the you know in America and the FDR with the New Deal and all these sort of programs that that rebuilt mm -hmm. America after World War II and created this economic powerhouse and everybody shared in the wealth and all that. That's this is just what we need. We need coronavirus right now. Then of course, people who argue the opposite say, no, this is going to wreak havoc. We're not going to ever be the same again. We're not going to recover. Uh, you're, you're seeing something that you didn't see in the Great Depression, which is that every single economy in the world has just stopped. Um, there isn't the sort of uh, built up productivity from the war and whatnot that just can't wait to sort of create better lives for everybody. Instead, we've got a situation where everything has screeched to a halt. And this is different and coronavirus is a disaster. And we, you know, it's everyone for themselves and we have to, uh, you know, create um, gated communities and bunkers and things that shelters that we can save ourselves and our family. And that's what we should be thinking about. So those are two possible uh, opposite takes on this. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's also that the environment is mending itself in the areas that we that they talk about fish returning to the Venetian canals. Yes. Uh, they talk right. about plumes of pollution vanishing from northern Italy and China. Um, uh, in, in exactly the same way that this is ridiculous, but in exactly the same way that happened during that volcanic ash incident, there are no planes overhead. They haven't been for days. And I'm well aware that that's causing other people suffering. For, for me, it's delightful not to have. So this is a, a little bit of a more specific, I think maybe, maybe the first one is a little better because it's less specific, but you're saying, mm -hmm. you know, coronavirus is good for the planet. So, mm -hmm basically because it's bad for us and we're bad for the yes, planet. Yes, we so, are bad for the planet. So, so this, is a, this is a welcome, a welcome yes. event. Um, hmm. Let me just rearrange a few things. I think I'm, try, I'm trying to think of, I haven't done anything with herd mentality, but that's inherent, I suppose, in some of these things. I was just thinking about social distancing and hikikomori for a minute. You you said, you know, um, what if we're better off alone? So um, I mean this th this makes me think a little bit about some of the different cultural attitudes of the East and the West, because the East seems to be very much more community focused and it's more multi-generational. I mean Italy's a little bit like this too, but you know, mm -hmm. this idea that, uh, you know, we really have to think about the greater good of the greater community and stop thinking about ourselves. Whereas in the U.S. and the U.K., it is very much about, you know, looking after our own. And the U.S. is the most extreme because it basically, sometimes people um, romanticize it by saying the U.S. is rugged individualism. The sort of uh, hankering after the kind of the pioneers of the Wild West, where people just sort of went off on their own and created a homestead, and that's the way you know things worked best, kind mm -hmm. of thing. And so it's like a Western or something like. Uh, um, mm -hmm. You know, I saw this. So this is a digression, but I, I watched this movie, um, "A Cult Is My Passport," a Japanese kind of gangster Western movie from mm -hmm. 1967 i think it was and um it's it's fun it's on it was on one of the streaming services at the moment and i hadn't seen it before and 
what I thought was kind of interesting is, is it's a film noir. Now, remember, we had the misogynoir <laughs> discussion. Yes, which is completely wrong, movie. which is totally wrong. Uh, yeah, yes. I'm so sorry about that. But anyway, <laughs> um, but we talked about film noirs in the West, often how these kind of femme fatales that sort of help mm-hmm. lead the protagonist, you know, on this journey to their own destruction and it's sort of why the tragedy. And I thought what was so interesting is this film is sort of a film noir kind of gangster Western. And there is a woman in it, but what's so fascinating, only one really um, major part, and she doesn't get to fa- place, play the film fatale because, and I think this is probably because it's a Japanese movie, which is thinking about community, mm. is that really the primary relationship is between this senior Yakuza guy, well, they're not really Yakuza, they're hitmen, the senior hitman and his junior hitman. So it's this relationship between them, a friendship and also a working relationship where the older hitman feels responsible for the survival of the younger hitman. And so it's that that gets him in trouble in a way. So even though the woman's there and she wants to flee with him and, maybe form a life together or something, he like looks beyond her and he's thinking about how do I protect my younger brother, as it were, in this relationship? Mm. And that's what is kind of his downfall. He has to sacrifice himself in a way to get his younger brother to safety. Um, <laughs> I thought that's great. That is, that is such a, you know, Japanese take on film noir, you know, the femme vitale, psh, you know, no, not her. It's, it's this. And she even says in one moment in the movie, she says, she watches the two of them and says, oh, I envy you men and your friendships. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, are we better off alone? Um, I'm just trying to think of that community individualist angle. So, so maybe well, it's you know, also, maybe you know, what if you're da- at libertarianism, you know, uh, but it's also, what if you're now a danger to others? And that's a way to tie into euthanasia is, is euthanasia acceptable if you are a danger to others? Oops. Well, elaborate. Euthanasia is acceptable if you're a danger to others. Well, so, uh, you know, community and family bonding is now a weakness because you're going to pass it on to your parents, you're going to pass it on to that weaker generation who are going to suffer the consequences. Uh, So here we had our great leader, Boris, telling people, don't go visit your mothers for Mother's Day. If you don't live with her, don't go and see her because you'll give her the disease and you'll kill her. And so actually, family bonding, uh, a closeness of generations is a bad thing, potentially in light of this. I mean, I'm, okay. I'm, yeah, so no, I'm trying, I'm trying to be deliberately. No, no, I know. I get it. So, yeah. so this is a kind of human bonds are a great weakness. This is sort of a, a humanity yes. question. Well, it's, it's, it's a re, it's a rephrasing of, are we better off alone really? But at least it's getting to, You know, if we could simply have these emotional necessities that are met, then to be freed of those human bonds, meaning that when society was in danger of fragmenting, you could just compartmentalize without any uh, repercussions. Mm -hmm. So let's see. um humanity will be our extinction okay this is not not perfect but again you know it's a provocative thought humanity will Mm -hmm. be our extinction and it's something that we can kind of elaborate on later i think you know yeah what i'm trying to do right now is just come up with some nice provocative statements based on our discussion and Mm -hmm. we can flesh them out Mm-hmm. And probably I will move that one. So that also that if we have it, a more general statement. Yeah. Yeah. Which, so therefore that, that ties in with your herd mentality thing of, again, humanity will be your extinction because if you're dealing with a herd and we are describing ourselves as a herd, 
then we are simply blindly following others. And as we're dis rapidly discovering from the increased democratization, I'm putting bunny ears around that, mm -hmm. of our society, the great uh, mass of humanity um, don't appear to make rational decisions. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm just saying they don't seem to be the, the decisions that would be reached by rational experts in the field in which the public are reaching. Well, I, I, I like to, I like to hold on to this one in the future and discuss mm -hmm. it because, you know, there are people who would say that, you know, uh, the problem with human beings is they're so irrational, that they're so predictable, that they keep mm -hmm. doing the same things over and over again. They don't seem to learn from their mistakes. And so mm -hmm. if we could just be rational beings, you know, we wouldn't have these problems, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's an argument that, yeah, so that's why humanity would be our extinction because we're just these emotional, rational animals and we don't, we don't evolve as we should do. But the other flip side of that is that if you become an ultra rational creature, you start, you can make some really terrible decisions that, that are terribly cruel because you've divorced yourself from your humanity and you start doing stuff that, that is, um, unconscionable and in a way that is sort of what we want our artificial intelligence to do for us we want to create these machines that don't have these emotional hmm. res responses or problems and have them make decisions for us so in a way i guess we'll be exploring that by creating these machines that just aren't they're, they're uber rational and we'll we'll see what happens so this is an interesting tension about what it means, what, what does humanity mean? And, and, you know, will it lead to our extinction or will it be our mm. savior? I mean, one thing that's kind of interesting in terms of what's happening in the marketplace is, is that, um, okay, so at, the, at this moment in time, the, the public stock markets have, have gone down about 40% or so. And lots of people are asking, you know, will it, will it come back? What do I do? What do I do with my money now? And this and that. And, Given all the indicators, it would seem sensible to say, no, that this market's going to be down for a long time. It's going to take a long time to recover. And someone I was listening to recently said, you know what? It depends on what country, what culture you're in, because the, the Europeans and the Asians, yes, they have long memories. They remember bad stuff and they tend to, that tends to inform the decisions. So uh, for example, European, wealthy European families were converting all their equity to cash the last couple of years because they saw these extremely um, high yielding markets and thought, this is a bad sign. If it's too good to be true, mm. it probably is. So they started getting out of the market. In the States, however, you know, people are advising to stay in. You'd be stupid to get out. Don't convert to cash. That's ridiculous. You know, the markets are so good. So what they were saying is that the market may bounce back on the U.S. sooner because the Americans have such short-term memories and they don't, they, don't, mm. they don't have history. They don't have a sense of history. They just keep mm. looking forward and thinking that everything is new. And indeed, I've been listening to you know, podcasts where people are saying, the situation we're in right now is unlike any other. We've never been in this situation before. So if anyone tells you they know what's going to happen, they're lying. And I'm thinking, well, that's not true. We've had things happen that weren't exactly like this, but... We've had world wars. We've had all kinds of things mm -hmm. that have had huge impacts on us. And we, and we know human nature. So we kind of know what is likely. It's not completely divorced mm -hmm. from any sense of reality. But that's the American response. It's like, we don't know. It's all new. It hasn't happened before. Mm -hmm. And so for that reason, things may actually bounce back here quickly because, mm -hmm. you know, of our own ignorance. <laughs> our sense of... We, do, we lack a sense of place historically, you know. Mm. Uh, so we like to repeat our mistakes um, as often as possible. Um, but then that's good. That means a herd mentality can be good because you're okay, free so. of rationality would lead you to uh, potentially worse resolutions. So what can we say about, you know, 
learning from mistakes. <laughs> sometimes the herd is right. Stupid. Sometimes the herd is right. Um, that's herd mentality, that's, actually, isn't it? It's like yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So sometimes uh, the herd is right. Okay. And that's we, the problem because you can't dismiss them every time, but they're also wrong a lot. Okay, so I'm going to take a here's here's my other provocative way of putting it is we are better off without history Ooh, geez. because okay. the because the if you don't have a sense of history yes you make the same mistakes over and over again so that's the people who would argue against this they'd say what are you talking yeah. about you know yeah. history repeats itself because you don't look back at it if you mm -hmm. learn from history you could make better informed decisions you could evolve and then this argument in terms of we're better without history says no, no, no. If we don't, if we're not under the shackles of history, we can make whatever we want because we don't yeah, have the, the kind of uh, the chains that bind us to some sense that it can't be done mm -hmm. or whatever. Like, you know, so if you're always looking forward and not looking back, then you can kind of reinvent yourselves all the time and you don't have to be tied to some narrow view of humanity or history or whatever. So that's actually mm -hmm. quite a, <laughs> I like that one. That's very that's good. That's the technology yeah, that's very good. of Silicon Valley, right? This, this to yeah. me is, I, I love kind of poking fun at Silicon Valley because it, it's one of those places that does have absolutely no sense of history or irony even about, you know, how everything is new and, oh, this is great. This is fantastic. And no one's ever done this before. And it's like, hey, read a history book. Mm -hmm. But, but um, it's the, yeah, the kind of captains of now or, or the future. So, mm -hmm. all right. So I think, I think we've actually got, you know, some useful yeah. – um, let me put that a little bit over here. Some useful resolutions. We got humanity will be our extinction. We got we are better off without history and coronavirus mm -hmm. is just what we need right now to save ourselves. So we're going to kind of conclude it here. Maybe in the time in between our next, before our next jam cast, we can sort of, you know, maybe tweak some of the wording of that. But, you know, that's good mm -hmm. for now. Mm -hmm. And then... You know, we're going to think about story messages so that we can create some interesting pitches off of those story messages. So I just re have that as a reminder. But next step mm -hmm. is to come up with some interesting story messages from these. And uh, I appreciate your patience. It's been a long. Uh, no, thank you. I'm sorry. But uh, good discussion. And uh, hopefully there's lots Very to good. think about. Definitely. Take care.